Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments or ask questions in our Facebook group. Welcome to the Two Testaments podcast, a guided journey through scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. In this episode, we're looking at Romans chapter three to four, a key passage on the topic of justification by faith. And today we're uh, pleased to be joined by Dr. Tom Schreiner. Uh, Dr. Tom Schreiner is the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation and Professor of Biblical Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Tom is the author of a number of books on Paul and the New Testament, uh, including this Romans commentary in the Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament series, which is now, this is the first edition, Tom, but it's now in its second edition. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Right. So hopefully your your views haven't changed too much. Pardon? Hopefully your views haven't changed too much. <laughs> uh, you've got to buy the second one. That's just all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right. Well, you might throw this conversation totally out of whack for us then. <laughs> well, Tom, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've written a lot about Romans. What first drew you to this book? When I was doing my PhD, I was interested in I suppose all seminary students are interested in this. How do you put the whole Bible together? So I did, I did my topic on circumcision and Paul, and that landed me into a whole discussion of the law. So I wrote a, a little book on the law and its fulfillment in the early 90s. And then uh, when Baker had an opening to do Romans, I think they asked me, I don't, I, you know, it's been so long ago. I think they asked me to do it. I don't think I asked them, I think they asked me and, you know, it just fit well with the, even the scholarly work I'd been doing on the law, because uh, I was, you know, I was talking about the new perspective when it really was the new perspective. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, not so new anymore, huh? It's not so new anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, how do you see Romans chapters three to four, especially, you know, Paul's statements on justification by faith, how do you see that fitting in with the rest of the book of Romans as a whole? Well, I would argue if you, you know, you just want a, a bird's eye picture of the book. I think there are tensions in Rome between uh, strong and weak, roughly Jews and Gentiles. I think Paul writes uh, this letter to uh, unify the churches, uh, but he wants to unify them according to his gospel. And uh, he hopes that the churches will be a launching point for his mission to Spain. But if, you're, but if he's going to explain his gospel to Jews and Gentiles, he's, he, he's got to explain the place of the law and uh, justification, because that's, that's, a, that's a crucial issue. And uh, for, so for instance, circumcision becomes a big part of that discussion because uh, that's the the entry marker into the people of God, according to the Old Testament. So Paul, who's well-versed in the scriptures uh, as a, you know, a disciple of Gamaliel, Paul, Paul had to deal with that issue and he had to explain to the churches how he understood the law. But I, I front circumcision because I think it was the presenting issue. Right. Now for you, what is the most difficult part of understanding Romans three to four and the presentation of justification here? Well, I think the most difficult paragraph, I don't know if this is what you're looking for, Will, but I think the most difficult paragraph in Romans is Romans three, one through eight. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jimmy Dunn says something, who wrote a commentary on Romans, but he says something that I really, uh, resonated with he said it's hard because it's like a railway station where everything all these other themes meet okay. so honestly you know when i read romans 3 1 through 8 i'm almost at the point where i want to pull down my commentary and say what did i say again <laughs> <laughs> because it's just it's just difficult on a number of levels i i, I think paul's responding to opponents I, th I think he's uh, 
anticipating chapter six. I think he's anticipating chapters nine through 11. So that's one reason I think the paragraph is so difficult because it's anticipating themes that he doesn't work out in that particular paragraph. So, uh, you know, many other portions of three and four are controversial, but, and, and actually th three, one through eight isn't a big point of discussion in terms of contemporary issues, but it's, but I think it's super hard. And if you look at it, just, you know, scanning over it right now, almost every verse ends either in a question mark or an exclamation point. So there is a lot going on there, but it's it's really important, but maybe hard to figure out what's going on because of those question marks. Yeah. And, it, you know, Paul, I mean, just an example here in 228 and 29, he argued, right, that what matters is not being ethnically Jewish or being physically circumcised. And then he says, you know, what's the advantage of being a Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? And you expect them to say nothing. Right. <laughs> and then he says much in every way. So yeah. it doesn't matter what the person's name is, but C.H. Dodd in his commentary says, Paul's argument makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he should have said it doesn't make any difference. But, but of course, I, we wouldn't want to follow Dodd here because we recognize Paul's a sophisticated and, and, and deep thinker so we want to and and he realizes what he just said right, and yeah. so but the the argument is incredibly nuanced as well and that that makes it difficult because that's why i said i think he's uh, anticipating romans 9 through 11 what what is the place of the jews in god's plan mm -hmm. especially since um gentile believers are are I think the majority in the Roman church. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, Tom, that in verse one, he says, what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? And then the response is much in every way. But then if you go down to verse nine, what then, are we uh, any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under the power. So he's kind of modulating between trying to calibrate what exactly are the advantages of right, to being, uh, to, to being Jewish or to being part of, you know, God's covenant with Israel. Exactly right, which is why this is so difficult to read, and we, we have to read it with uh, sensitivity. As great of a scholar as C.H. Dodd was, I think that's a, a rather a lead foot when he comes to this passage. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the church usually comes to chapters three and four, Tom, uh, trying to figure out how exactly are human beings justified before God. But Paul actually begins chapter three in a different way. Um, he, he actually seeks to justify God before us. He says in verse four, let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, and here he's going to quote from the Psalms, so that you may be justified when you speak and prevail when you judge. Why does Paul need to justify God? And is he successful in justifying God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that's really at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? The, the heart of the gospel is the, the vindication of who, of who God is. And I, I think that's a fundamental question for Paul when in the justification of sinners, uh, is God righteous? Uh, mm. So... Uh, and, and clearly, he says right at the outset here in 3-4, which I think is a very important verse, um, is God righteous because every, every human being is a liar, which is, which is another way of saying it. I think every human being is a sinner. But also, if we retract back to chapter 1, uh, and even Old Testament allusions, every human being is an, an idolater at the end of the day. So, so how... How, how can God be justified? How can God stand in the right to allow idolaters and liars into, into his presence? Right. So even in, in Paul's thinking, it seems like the just response is no justification for anyone, right? Since everyone's under sin. That, that's right. And, and of course, you know, we have an allusion here to Psalm 51.4 where you, you have David, I take it, David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. And, and I think 
Paul's argument here. So, because one of the things I think he's doing in three, one through eight, he's trying to argue and, and say to some, I take it, it's so debated, but yeah. I take it Jewish opponents. I think, he's, I think he's trying to say, look, God is justified in judging the world. Because I think an objection Jewish opponents have to Paul's gospel is, uh, look, you're, 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 you're saying there's forgiveness of sins for people, but that's, that leads to anti-nomination in 3.8. And I think Paul's argument is, this is why it's very finely modulated. No, God, God, God is in the rights to judge the entire world. Every, everyone's a liar. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone's fallen short. And yet at the same time, he does not compromise his rightness in justifying sinners. So Paul's trying to do both things, which is one of the reasons he's so that's, he's so hard to understand sometimes. Right. You just mentioned in verse eight that uh, Paul is addressing the potential objection of antinomianism, right? This idea that you, you don't have to obey the law at all. You can do whatever you want. So verse eight, let us do evil. That good may result. So why would someone think that Paul was advocating that kind of a view and, and how does he respond to it? Yeah, well, as I said, I believe these verses anticipate the argument in chapter six. So when we think of how chapter five ends, Paul essentially argues at the end of chapter five, the law was given that the transgression would increase. That's a shocking statement from someone raised on Torah. Uh -huh. The law was given not to curb transgressions, to it, but to increase it. I, I think there's more to say about the law, but clearly this is a part of it. And But then he says, uh, where sin increased, grace super increased, we could translate it. So then the objection in chapter six is, well, then, then clearly the logical implication of your gospel is that we should continue in sin uh, so that God's grace could be featured in forgiving us of our sin. So, so I think he's anticipating what he's going to say in chapter six, because notice what he says here. Oh, these people, they deserve to be condemned, but that's not an argument. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, they're condemned for saying that, but he doesn't tell us why yeah. they're condemned. So I think he's going to explain in chapter six, actually, my gospel well, you know, I'm stealing someone else's show now, right? But um, <laughs> ac actually, my gospel, chapter six, doesn't lead people to sin more. It actually leads to uh, triumph over sin. Hmm. Paradoxically enough, you, you, yeah. you might think a gospel that said, uh, the more sin, the more grace would actually lead to uh, an antinomianism. But Paul says that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what I'm saying. Um, Tom, so, so we've been talking about sin quite a bit, right? And that God would be unjust, right? To justify someone who is sinful and all people are sinful in Paul's thought. Well, in verses 11 to 18 of chapter three, Paul paints a portrait of human beings. It's going to flesh out his understanding of sin. It's a very bleak portrait. Yeah, of both Jews and Gentiles. And he quotes from a compilation of Old Testament passages from the Psalms and from Isaiah. Tell us a little bit about this portrait and what it tells us about the extent of the human problem with sin. Yeah, well, well th these texts, you know, we wish we had time to, uh, to look at them in, in context. Psalm 14, Ecclesiastes 720, other, other texts that he brings in here. But I think the first thing we should say is if we if we consider Paul's method, he's he's arguing, right? He's arguing scripturally. He 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 doesn't he as an apostle, he's not merely presenting his opinion, but he wants to give a scriptural backing for uh, what he's saying. I mean, in one way that's obvious, but we ought not to miss that. That he weaves together so many texts to uh, to make his point about the universality of uh, of sin. So um, 
you know, it's really quite interesting because in some of these uh, Old Testament references, you have a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Mm -hmm. You know, Psalm 14. <laughs> Yet Paul argues from these texts that sin is universal. And uh, I would argue that Paul's not only interpreting these texts, but he's also interpreting them in light of the whole canon of the Old Testament. So he is interpreting these texts, but he's saying if you read the whole storyline of the Bible, and, and I think that it also brings us to chapter five and, and to Adam, what we see is no one is exempt. The, uh, by birth, no one, no one is in the category of, uh, of the righteous. And, and of course, his gospel this gospel doesn't make much sense if there's not a, a recognition of the universality of human sin. And if I could just say a pastoral word here, this, this is the pressure point in our culture today, mm -hmm. I believe. The pressure point is most people in our culture, I'm talking about unbelievers now, most believers in our culture, they do not have this radical uh, view, of view of sin. And therefore, the gospel that Jesus saves, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't scratch an itch. I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a sinner like this. So this very bleak portrait of, of human beings, it's, uh, it, it has to be, in a sense, understood or heard first. Now, some people already know this, right? And, and they have the sense of this. Luther certainly had a great sense of this in his own life. But, uh, but I think in our culture today, this, this vision of universal sin doesn't, it doesn't resonate with most people. Right. Yeah. The, you, the other thing I think about this portrait of sin that Paul is uh, painting for us, I mean, he basically gives us a picture of a human being, right? So, and he'll talk about all the different body parts of the human, right? So he'll say uh, their throats are open graves, right? They use their tongues to deceive uh, the venom of vipers under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet. So it goes from the head now down to the feet. Their feet are swift to shed blood ruin and misery are in their paths uh, and they the way of peace they have not known there is no fear of god before their eyes right so paul is kind of really painting this portrait of, of a human being through scripture right and then it seems like he's placing everyone it's not just that he's saying both jews and gentiles are under sin but it seems like and tom i'd be curious to hear what you think about this for many people the the problem of sin is one of status hmm. Right. So uh, you are unrighteous. You have a status of unrighteousness before God. But it seems that when, when Paul says that all Jew and Gentile, the whole world is under sin, is that the whole world, that every human being is under sin's grip and power, mm. which then results in an unrighteous status. Well, what do you what would you make of that, Tom? Yeah, well, I, yes, I think so. And I, I like what you say, you know, from the eyes to the feet, from from the head, from your head to your toes, you're a sinner. I like I like that. That was, yeah. that was very nice. Um, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you look at Romans chapter five and Romans six, and I think it's suggested here as well. Uh, where is it in three? Um, you know, 319 as well. Uh, every mouth is shut and the whole world is accountable before God. I think, mm. I think, I think the, the law is also a, a power and sin is a power that reigns and rules over us. Mm. So I think it's a mistake, even when we're talking about the imputation of Christ's righteousness, I think it's a mistake finally to separate status from condition right i i think we can distinguish those so that's a very important discussion but yeah. ultimately they're inseparable right it, it doesn't make sense to say we have the status of sinners if we're not under the control of sin right in fact it seems that that's at the heart of the paradox of justification right is how do you get an ungodly person right who gets this the declaration of righteousness right? There's a mismatch. And so if people are under the power of sin, how is Paul going to, you know, going to resolve right. that? That's part of the... Uh... Yeah. And then that gets us to the heart of the issue here, right? So Paul has established the universality of the sin. What's the solution? What does it mean to be justified? 
here, Tom? Yeah, well, my, my argument is, is certainly not new, but I, th I think Paul argues in 321 uh, through 26 that you, you look at the key words here, with, through, through Christ we're justified, uh, uh, declared to be in the right, I take that, and we're redeemed, and, and then you have this word hilasterion, which I translate in my second edition, I can't remember what I did in the first one, as mercy seat. Uh, I think that's the right uh, translation of that term, but the but the mercy seat is the place of atonement. The, right. The, let, me, let me just read that verse, Tom. Um, okay. they, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a set. The NRSV says sacrifice atone, of atonement by his blood effective through faith, which you want to translate as the mercy seat. Mercy seat. Yeah. But I, I don't think the NIV translation and what I'm saying are at odds. No, right, sure. And I think it's right to uh, include the idea here of propitiation. Uh, I think there is a satisfaction of, uh, of God's wrath. So I think the notion of a penal substitutionary atonement is in this text that Christ takes the penalty, there's penal, okay. that we deserve. And uh, he appeases God's wrath. Obviously, there's many ways that could be misunderstood. Um, I, I think I think God, God and Christ, the Father and Christ, are working in concert in this. Right? The the Father, the Father sends His Son, but the Son willingly goes of His own of His own will and His own delight. As well, so um, yeah. It, it's not it's not as if the the father constrained the son to go I, because this can often be misunderstood and right. especially in popular circles and and some sermonic illustrations which we understand the illustrations but we we, we have to be careful uh, at this point so so i think paul's argument and i th i think cranfield in a very good commentary explains this well moo explains this well in his commentary what we have here is in 326, God is both the just and the justifier, right? In the cross, God's, God's justice is vindicated, his holiness, because since Christ took the penalty we deserved, his justice is satisfied, but he also displays his love. So they come together at the cross, right? You have, you have, you have, uh, you have justice and mercy coming together in the cross in a wonderful way. Or you could put it the, the saving righteousness, and the judging righteousness of God come together in the cross. That's another way of saying the same thing. Right. So you, I mean, you said something uh, there that I think it's important to highlight. You said saving righteousness. Yeah. Um, because we have a parallel here in Romans chapter three with Romans chapter one, right? In Romans chapter three, uh, verse 21, we have, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Yeah. And we have had a similar sounding statement in chapter one, verse 16, right? Where Paul says, or verse 17, that in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the right, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Um, how do you see, how do you untake the righteousness of God there in those two passages? You, you, you use the phrase saving righteousness. Is that how you're, are you glossing that phrase righteousness of God as God's saving righteousness? Yeah, well, in, in 321 and 322, yes. In, three, in 325 and 326, I think there's more of an emphasis on judging righteousness. I think okay. that they come together ultimately, but I think it's a, I think it's a both and. In one seventeen, though, I think the focus is on God's saving righteousness. I mean, that was the great discovery of Luther, right? He he believed initially that verse was talking about the judging righteousness of God, and if, if you remember what Luther says, he says, and I, I didn't see how that was the gospel, and I didn't love God because of that. I hated him. <laughs> right. But then, but then a very interesting thing, I mean, Luther was, you know, teaching through the Psalms where you often have uh, the word righteousness uh, used and in parallel with salvation, some very interesting 
uses there. I think Luther began to understand. No, no, the word righteousness often does refer, I think one way to describe it is God's God saving rightness. Mm -hmm. um, I also, but I, I would also want to add, I think when we're talking about the righteousness of God, I think it's, I think the traditional Protestant view is correct, that it's the gift of God given to sinners by which they're declared to be in the right. But I also think there's an idea here of an attribute of God, so to speak. Right. God, God gives us his own righteousness, which I, I think it's important to say, in other words, God gives, him, gives us himself. Uh, otherwise, it becomes, a, it sounds like a very abstract legal discussion, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, and and there is a legal dimension to it. We have a legal metaphor here, but the but the righteousness and here here, you can see I'm very taken with Luther. <laughs> I can see, yeah. <laughs> Luther says we're married to Christ. You know what what we receive. I think it's in Calvin too. Uh, it's, in, it's in Romans seven too, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're, we're united to Christ. So. So yes, we receive the righteousness of God, but why do we receive the righteousness of God? It's not, not just some abstract legal uh, entity. We're, we're given Christ himself. He is our, he is our righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30. So I, I, think it's, I think sometimes, at least evangelicals can describe it in, in legal terms, but leave out uh, inadvertently the idea that our righteousness is Christ himself finally. Hmm. Second Corinthians 5 21, it's God's righteousness in Christ, which is very interesting because you see the reformers emphasize very much our union with Christ. At the, uh, we're, we're righteous because we're united with Christ in his death and resurrection. Right, right. Well, not only does Paul tell us how someone is justified, he also repeatedly tells us how a person is not justified. Uh, Paul repeatedly tells us that a person is justified by faith and not by works of the law in verse 20 and verse 28 of chapter 3. Now, Tom, in a, in a previous journal article, you've said this, it is probable that when Paul speaks against righteousness by works of law, in the context of Romans 3, 27 to 4, 5, he is opposing legalism, i.e. the attempt to earn salvation by doing good works. Now, Tom, why would some scholars today disagree with your take here? I mean, that, you know, I was reading this, you know, and I've, you know, I've been working on Paul uh, in the course of my dissertation, and, you know, in light of what's in the history of scholarship on Paul, and we don't want to get too deep into the history of yeah. scholarship on Paul, but what you just said there is actually quite startling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why, why would P, uh, P, some scholars have an objection to the way you described salvation not by works of the law as, some, as though it was earning salvation that Paul is opposing? Right. Well, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to say something else first. Okay. And that is, I think... Well, I would argue, and I do argue this in my, in my work, that Paul's fundamental argument isn't people are condemned because they're legalists. Okay. I don't think that's his fundamental argument. Okay. I think his fundamental argument is people are condemned because they're disobedient. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I think that's very important, and I, I try to emphasize that at least in my commentary, and I hope I emphasize that in the article, but it was written so long ago I don't remember. <laughs> sure. But uh, because the, the legalism, which is controversial, and, I, and legalism doesn't, in one sense, legalism trying to earn righteousness by works, it's not necessarily a bad thing, I would argue. If Romans 4.2, if, if, if Abraham, what does that verse say exactly? But we should read it. Um, if Abraham was justified by works, he has a reason for boasting, but not before God. Now, what that verse means is quite controversial, but I read it as follows. If Abraham did the requisite works, he has a legitimate reason for boasting. So there's a sense, I would argue, in which Paul, meritorious obedience in one sense, there's no problem with it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? 
because Paul says if Abraham did the requisite works, he'd have a reason for boasting. I don't think Paul disagrees with that, but he says, but not before God. Does, some people think he's saying there, but not before God, because even if you do all the requisite works, you're condemned anyway. Mm -hmm. That's not how I read this verse. Right. I think his argument is, of course, he's, he's not uh, righteous before God on the basis of his works because he didn't do them. <laughs> Because he was because he was disobedient. I think that's mm -hmm. Paul's argument. So then, then you go to the next step. For people who are disobedient to try to earn their righteousness before God, to merit their obedience before God, uh, that that's what legalism is. That that's uh, that's silly, and it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a form of self deception. So that that's how I read the text. Right. Why do some people disagree with that? Well, that's the, I mean, I, I mean, at the heart of this is the phrase, the works of the law, yeah, right? Yeah. That Paul says justification, not by uh, not by works of the law. And it seems like at the heart of this is that, you know, scholars are not not all scholars are convinced that Paul was opposing uh, Jewish legalism in his day, that that is uh, a reading in to Paul's text and into Paul's day, the uh, disputes between, you know, Luther and the Catholic Church. Right. So maybe you, you could flesh that a little bit out for us. So there's, yeah, right. what's, what's going on there? Well, I think you're right. So you have scholars reading those Jewish sources and reading the Old Testament, but let's talk about, you know, the Jewish writings in the second temple period, the writings that aren't in our scriptures, right? But, you know, you have the Pseudepigrapha, for the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Um, so they're saying, look, this whole idea, this whole idea that the Jews were legalistic and trying to earn their salvation by works, it's a myth. It's not in the text. It's been, uh, it's been read into the text, and I think you said this, it's been read into the text because the texts have been read through the lens of uh, the Reformation Catholic disputes of the 16th century. So, so so then, the, you know, what, what is the move that is made by scholars like Jimmy Dunn and N.T. Wright, who do so many good things, mm -hmm. but I don't agree with them on this. Uh, they argued then works of the law doesn't refer to, well, I, I got to be careful. Works of the law focuses on, right. on the boundary markers, like right. circumcision and Sabbath and food laws. He's not talking about... Uh, trying to be justified by moral works. It's more ceremonial works. So I'm, I'm going fast so we can- No, back. that's perfect, so, yeah. So he says, you know, someone like Wright would say it's more a matter of, a, of ecclesiology than soteriology. It's more, right. of, it's more of a matter of who's included in the, in the people of God. It, it's more of a horizontal instead of a vertical issue. Right, so the problem that Paul is encountering according to that reading of the works of the law, if the works of the law are circumcision, food laws, and kind of ritual works associated with the law, then the problem Paul is countering is Jews uh, who are using those laws to keep Gentiles out of the people of God. That's right. It's nationalism. It's exclusivism. I mean, right. Instead of legalism. Right. right. Now you 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 don't you don't buy this, right? I don't I don't buy it. <laughs> so t t tell us, tell us why not, and then give us why you, you take you understand the works of law in a different way. So uh, my my argument in one way is very simple. If you boil it down, I argue that the phrase "works of law" refers to the entire law, and I interact especially in my article uh, with Dunn uh, because he wrote a commentary on Romans. I guess Wright did as well, but it's briefer. Um, it's very interesting in chapter two, when Paul indicts the Jews, I guess it relates to your discussion last week, but I'm going to say Jews in Romans <laughs> chapter two, um, 17 and following, I don't think he indicts them fundamentally for excluding the Gentiles on I don't, he brings up circumcision, but I don't think his indictment is you're nationalistic and you're exclusive. I think his argument instead is you're disobedient. You, you say, you say, you, say um, uh, you don't, shouldn't steal, but do you steal? Mm 
I, yeah, you 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 say that we shouldn't commit a, a idolatry, but you rob temples. Right. And and I think it's the same argument in three nine through eighteen. Fundamentally, the sins that he points to are sins of speech and action. So I think one of the problems, one of the problems with the new perspective reading, if I can call it that, is that they. They, they foreground something that I think Paul doesn't actually foreground. It was very interesting when I wrote that article, Dunn, and I, I wasn't the only one writing things like this, but Dunn mm -hmm. responded by saying, actually works of law does refer to the whole law. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that before. He, but after the, some of these things came out, he goes, no, it does refer to the whole law, but the focus so this, this is where right. he's, the focus is on the boundary markers. But I would argue that's not even true. I don't think, I think the boundary markers are included. I think the new perspective says something right. Exclusivism is a problem. There is an ethnocentrism. So I don't reject what, what they're saying. I'm just wanting to say, look, the, Paul's, Paul's fundamental argument is not, not that they're excluding. His fundamental argument. And then he proceeds to say, and... And they're trying to be right with God anyway, and that's what legalism is. And and then I would just say, look, it's it's all there in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? He's the the Pharisee's bragging about in the parable all the things he's done, and it's not, it's 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 his morality, right? It is exclusivistic, but he thinks he's better than the tax collector. Then that's that's the heart of what legalism is. I'm I. I God, God is privileged to have me on his side because look what I, I've done. Look what I've ob, ob, uh, obtained and achieved. Um, so yeah. I would say, yes, the new perspective is right. Watch out for exclusivism, but don't throw out the other theme. And this is something that's extraordinarily interesting to me. You know, if you read Calvin and Luther, this was a dispute they had with the Roman Catholics on works of law. If you read the Roman Catholic interpreters during the time of the Reformation, they they argued, look, the works of the law refer to um, circumcision and food laws. They're not talking about moral works. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a new debate. <laughs> right. Well, let's move into chapter four now. And here we have Abraham and David who appear in Paul's argument. What role do they play here? Yes, well, of course, Abraham is the uh, progenitor of the Jewish people. So he's just a nat, Paul naturally selects him as, a, as exhibit A. And in second temple Jewish literature, Abraham is typically featured for his obedience. Mm -hmm. Well, that's surprised. I mean, if you read Genesis, you're gonna probably say, look at Gen Genesis 22. I think that's what really seizes people's imaginations. And I, in a way, not wrongly. I mean, because James picks that up, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, so, but I think Paul, Paul, Paul takes us back to the whole story and says, look, look at Genesis 15, 6. It, it begins with his faith. It doesn't begin with his obedience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think James contradicts that. That's another discussion for another time. But it Abraham wasn't right with God fundamentally because of his obedience, but because of his faith. And I think Paul's countering a common Jewish narrative of his day. And uh, then he brings in Psalm 32 and David uh, to make the same point. I mean, David was a, was a sinner. So, you know, there's a sense in which we could say both David and Abraham were righteous people. I don't think Paul would disagree, but I keep using the word fundamentally. That right. uh, well, at, the, at the foundation, at the base, they are sinners who need forgiveness of sins. Now, Tom, to, to pick up on Romans 4 and the use of Abraham, he does bring up circumcision there, right? Yeah. So I kind of want to say, I mean, don't the new perspective folks kind of have a point? Like, even when he's talking about Abraham, he wants to flash to circumcision, right? Uh, what do you make of that? Yeah, well, I, I would just say I'm a both ander. Okay. I, so I, I tried to say this briefly earlier. I think the new perspective rightly says, you know, these boundary markers are, are to be included in the discussion as well. Okay. Uh, 
I'm not denying that there's an ethnocentrism and I'm grateful for new perspective scholars uh, pointing right. out to us. So I, I, I don't, I'm just arguing it's not an either or. Okay. But, but I, I'm, I'm going to step beyond that, right? Because I wanna say the re reformers are fundamentally right. I mean, even, even in four, nine through 12, what does Paul say? It's, it's righteousness by faith. Your righteousness is reckoned to you, Genesis 15, six, which plays a huge role hermeneutically in this chapter. Genesis 15, 6, you're, Abraham was right by believing, not, not doing. He believed, he believed God's promise. And I think uh, what's lurking behind this is Joshua 24, 2. Um, Abraham came from a family of idolaters hmm. um, in Joshua 24, 2. He, so God justifies the ungodly. Abraham's part of that un ungodly group. He came from a family of idolaters and God calls him by his grace out of Ur of the Chaldees. So um, both Abraham and David, they're, 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 not, they're not superstars at the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think that's, that's really helpful. The other point is that circumcision seems to stand as representative for the law. At least that's how that's how I read it there. Yes, yes, and it's such a big question because it's uh, do Gentiles, you know, uh, the natural way of reading Genesis seventeen, right? Do Gentiles have to be circumcised right. to be part of the part community of the, yeah. they're redeemed? And right. if you read Genesis seventeen, he says it's an everlasting covenant. <laughs> so you'd think, of course, you have to be circumcised. So right. Paul has to spend a lot of time on this. Right. Now, Tom, is Paul coherent? I mean, he wants to say that justification is not by works of the law here in chapters three to four. But then in chapter two, he seems to me to say the opposite. It's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be justified in verse 13. How do you make sense of that? I mean, is Paul trying to have his cake and eat it too? What's the what's the deal? Well, uh, of course, uh, you talked about Romans two last week. It's very fiercely debated. Uh -huh. uh, people I greatly respect, like Doug Moo, Frank Thielman, they take those statements on obedience to be hypothetical. Right. That is, no one actually uh, fills that category. But so it's a tough issue. You know. I, Do you take I, him as hypothetical? No, but no, I just okay. want to say, I want to say, you know, we're faced again with, man, who, none of us would have written it this way, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, but, but I take it to be uh, a genuine obedience that I'm, I want to say, so here, here actually Wright and I agree, at least in part, it's a genuine obedience that is necessary for salvation, I would say. But but here I'm closer to the reformers in that I'd say it's a necessary fruit and not an and, and and Wright would say, although I'm not always sure what he means when he says this. We discussed this in person in 2010 in Atlanta. Wright would say it's a necessary basis. I don't want to use the word basis because I want to say again, fundamentally, we come in as uh those who are receiving God's grace in Christ, and but that grace is a transformative grace. And for Paul, if there's not a transformation, even at the end of the chapter, what does he say about Abraham's faith? Abraham's faith was a living and active thing. Um, it leads to the sacrifice of Isaac. It leads him to believe that God can raise the dead. So I think that's what Paul's after in Romans 2. True faith is transformative. We begin with an empty hand, but when we're united to Christ by faith, we receive the spirit. And, and it, isn't it very interesting in 228 and 29, what does he say? He says it's by the spirit. I think you have new covenant language there. Mm -hmm. That's very important to me. And I think the hypothetical people don't see that. It's by the spirit that, that this obedience is taking place. So yeah, I don't agree with those who say, yeah, this is not a real obedience. Right. So, I mean, I wonder if part of the problem we're creating for ourselves is that 
is the issue I mentioned earlier of separating out the status of an individual uh, from their like actual, you know, whether they are righteous or not. Yeah, so when we separate them out, we kind of um, try to take these things on separately, right? Whereas on the other hand, you could say that someone who was ungodly or unrighteous and then is justified, well, Paul's logic is very clipped. I, I think Ross Wagner used that language when we interviewed him on Romans 9 to 11. I've, I've, I've kind of used the language of Paul uses compressed logic, Yeah. <laughs> right? So he will have someone who's ungodly, right? Or a sinner. And then that sinner is justified. Well, there's a whole bunch of things that have happened to that ungodly person. And it's part of the tension and the issue in, is, is figuring out what is all the intervening things that have happened, right? Right. Which is why we've had a long discussion <laughs> 2,000 years about what Paul means. I am I am, I'm happy to side, I'm, re I'm reading right now Michael Horton's volume one on the history of justification. I don't know if you've read that volume, but I think Horton is right and the reformers were right that there's an imputation of Christ's righteousness that is given to us. It, 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 there is a status element to it, but as, as all the reformers are argued, and I think it's in Paul, you're united to Christ and you receive all that he is there, but, but there is a status element in justification. So I would still distinguish myself from a Roman Catholic view where justification is an, an infusion of righteousness and a process of becoming more righteous. And so in that sense, I want to retain the idea of a status of a declaration Okay. because you can see why in the Roman Catholic view, it's not just Roman Catholics today. Yeah you can see why you could lose your justification because it's a it's a progressive experience that can actually be lost now it depends on how you read the text but i'll read the text that way right right so, yeah. well tom thank you so much for reading the text with us uh, over the last uh, few minutes here and helping us walk through some of the issues in this long-standing 2000 year long <laughs> debate that we've just talked about uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, finally, the final thing we'd like to ask you is if you might contribute to the popular genre amongst biblical scholars, I think you've written a few of these in your time, the blurb. Uh, is there anything that you would like to blurb? It could be a book, but it could be something else that you found uh, interesting or helpful recently, whether that's a, a movie or a TV show or a life hack or anything else. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> So I'll just mention two things. So I listen to a lot of audio books and uh, my family, I've wanted to read this for a long time, but I'm reading uh, Wallace Stegner, A Big Rock Candy Mountain. And okay. <laughs> I love that book. It's really fascinating. So that's the first thing I'll blurb. And then the second thing, the, I, I feel embarrassed to say this because I was a literature major, right? But I have never, <laughs> ever, read a book by John Steinbeck. Oh, okay. oh. And I just read, listened to East of Eden. I don't know if you've read that book, but it is full of the Bible. I mean, it's, uh -huh. the, it's the story of Cain and Abel really massaged through a bunch of different stories. Sure. And I just love that book. It was, it was fabulous. So, you know, um, I just say to people, we're all busy, but one of the great things about uh, the technology of our time is uh, the access to audio books. I just, I just, I've, I've listened to a ton of books. I read histories, and but I, I read a lot of, or listen to a lot of novels. Hmm. Right? So I commend, I commend Wall, my two most recent, my Wall Stegner and John Steinbeck, East of Eden. Well, I was also a literature major, so I appreciate the literary, literary recommendation there. That's fantastic. And, you know, in addition to audiobooks, you can also listen to podcasts. That's another great thing about the time yes, in which we right. live. Right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, Tom. We really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through uh, Romans 3 to 4. Um, and thanks to you listeners for listening to the two Testaments or watching, however you're consuming this podcast um and if you enjoyed this guided journey through scripture you can find our website at the two uh there you can subscribe you can also 
subscribe wherever you find podcasts and give us a rating, you know, a five-star rating, preferably. Uh, you can keep the lower ones to yourself. Um, and if you didn't like the episode, that's okay. You can still give us a five-star rating. One that is based not on our works, <laughs> but a five-star rating based on your mercy and commitment to catapult us into podcasting glory and fame. <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Until next time, take care. The Two Testaments is produced with the support of Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to Joe Zellner, Jody McFarlane, and the team in the Faculty Success Center, and our student assistants, Carson Knopf, Jake Maddox, Harrison Pike, and Gracie Plum, for their help with production, editing, and promotion. 